that autumn, months after the glamorous opening, he and his wife, Mel, went to eat at the Four Seasons. Rothko was someone who thought it was immoral to spend more than five bucks on a meal and was often perfectly happy with a Chinese takeaway. The cheaper, the better. But as he sat among the millionaires with Mel, his heart and his confidence sank like a stone. Anybody who will eat that kind of food for that kind of money will never look at a painting of mine. The next morning, he looked at the 30 or so paintings, some of the most beautiful and moving things not only Rothko, but any modern artist had ever created, and saw only the ruin of a great project. His paintings would never hang in the Four Seasons. Manhattan had beaten Mark. Or had art triumphed over money? After all, how many artists do you know who would say no to two and a half million dollars. Rothko had made sure his contract gave him ownership of the pictures if the job went sour. It was almost as if he always hoped that one day, somewhere else perhaps, he would be able to resurrect his idea to make a space his space. Later that year, a curator came to invite him to exhibit in the Castle Art Fair in Germany. When I was a younger man, art was a lonely thing. No galleries, no collectors, no critics, no money. Yet it was a golden age, for we all had nothing to lose and a vision to gain. Today, it is not quite the same. It is a time of tons of verbiage, activity, consumption. Which condition is better for the world at large? I will not venture to discuss. But I do know that many of those who are driven to this life are desperately searching for those pockets of silence where we can root and grow. We must all hope we find them. The man who'd taken a stand for art over money made the German an offer. If you build a chapel of expiation for the Holocaust, he said, it need only be a tent. I'll paint you something for free. It never happened.
Mark Rothko spent the next 10 years, all that he had left of his life, searching for that perfect wayside chapel where he could realize the vision that had been frustrated at the Four Seasons. A one-man show in 1961 at the Museum of Modern Art, which he went to every single day, brought him some cheer, and his work was selling better than ever. But with success, his life actually got shabbier. His tippling, which began at 10 o'clock in the morning, developed into serious alcoholism. And his chain smoking, a lifelong habit, brought him heart and lung problems, and his second marriage was breaking up. Shadowed by melancholy, his work got darker and more intense, just as modern art was going pop. For Rothko, painting had always been an alternative to pop culture, not its accomplice. But this seemed to be what the galleries wanted now. Stuck in the mode of painting he'd been doing for 15 years, he was defensive, angry. So when he did break out of his old style, it was to go raven black, as black as Texas oil. Texas finally provided Rothko with the chance to realize the vision thwarted in the Four Seasons. Art patrons John and Dominic de Manil commissioned him to produce a set of murals for a chapel to be built in Houston in 1965. Giving Rothko freedom to install exactly what he wanted. If the Four Seasons paintings were content to make a gesture at the other world, the Houston Chapel buries you in a tomb. Tanks of ink have been spilled trying to persuade us that this place is not as dark and funereal as it seems, a systematic dimming of the light that had always burned intensely in Rothko's greatest works. But quite honestly, sitting here, do we feel bright and beautiful? I'm not sure. Those rippling edges, flaring with light, which gave Rothko's pictures, so much of their movement have gone. In their place, an inky night. It's almost as though he's painting to see how dark he can make the light. Good luck. And good night. It's hard not to feel the Houston Chapel isn't some sort of live burial, an interment, not just of Rothko's future, but of his hopes for art. Then, into the blackness, in painting after painting, came a luminous zone of milky grey. Like the rim of a planet lit by the moon. As if Rothko was already gone off into deep space, presiding over the moment of creation, dividing the light from the darkness the earth from the heavens, bent on heroic self-cremation. So you see, 
I got it all wrong that morning in 1970. I'd thought seeing the Seagram paintings would be like a trip to the cemetery of abstraction. All dutiful reverence, a dead end. Look at this one. What do you see? A hanging veil suspended between two columns. An opening that beckons or denies entrance. A blind window. For me, it's a gateway. If some of those portals are blocked, others open into the unknown space that Rothko talked about, the place that only art can take us, far away from the buzzing static of the moment and towards the music of the spheres. Everything Rothko did to these paintings the column-like forms suggested rather than drawn, the loose stainings, were all meant to make the surface ambiguous, porous, perhaps softly penetrable, a space that might be where we came from or where we will end up. They're meant not to keep us out, but to embrace. From an artist whose highest compliment was to call you a human being. Can anything be less cool than this room in the heart of Tate Modern, further away from the rassle-dazzle of contemporary art, the frantic hustle of now. This isn't about now. This is about forever. This is a place where you come to sit in the low light and feel the eons rolling by, to be taken towards the gates that open onto the thresholds of eternity, to feel the poignancy of our comings and our goings, our entrances and our exits, our births, and our deaths, womb, tomb, and everything between, cannot ever be more complete, more powerful. I don't think so.